sorry for that delay. We'll get started. Um, welcome everyone to the 2023 PI conference. We'll get started here in just a minute. My name is Shannon Steamy, and I will be your moderator for today's session, Overview of Hyper-IgM Syndrome. I'm excited to welcome Dr. Condido Nieto, who will be presenting this topic. There will be some time for questions at the end of the presentation. Please submit any questions that you have to the presenter in the Q&A section of the platform. Dr. Antonio Condido Neto is a senior professor of immunology at the Institute of Biomedical Sciences, University at San Paulo. He's also the director of the Jeffrey Modell Center. A renowned leader, Dr. Condido Neto, has coordinated over 42 research projects in the area of immunology, clinical immunology, primary immunodeficiencies, and pharmacology. He has authored countless publications and is a trusted expert in a number of medical societies, including the Brazilian Group of Primary Immunodeficiency and the Brazilian Society of Pediatrics. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Condido Nito. Thank you very much for this kind introduction and for this kind invitation to present on uh, hyper-IgM syndrome. I'll try to cover uh, the most important uh, occurrences on that group of patients so that we can uh, share our knowledge and uh, discuss some uh, proposals. So I will share my screen with you. So, um, CD40 ligand deficiency. Um, Hyper IgM syndrome is actually a group of uh, diseases that are, uh, includes some of genetic conditions. And the most important one is the CD40 ligand deficiency. So what happens? Uh, CD40 ligand is uh, a very important molecule involved on activating the T cells in order to allow them uh, to interact with uh, other cells. I would say other lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, and mononuclear cells in order to activate them, for instance, uh, for effector functions, for uh, making antibodies, and the switch class. Um, you may know that IgM is uh, an immunoglobulin that starts the immune response, but afterwards, it's important to have a class switch in order to produce memory anti antibodies, and the principal ones are IgG, IgA, and uh, sometimes uh, IgE for the allergic patients. But uh, it is very important to make this class switch. Mainly, uh, IgG is the principal antibody that we have in order to protect us from infections. IgA is a very important antibody that will stay in our mucosal barriers in order to protect us, for example, from respiratory diseases, from uh, the GI tract infections, and uh, so on. As well, the CD40 ligand and CD40 interactions are very important to activate the phagocytes for example, macrophages that will uh, phagocyte intracellular bacteria and eventually kill them. Uh, you will see some examples in this presentation, like um, some fungal infections, like in tuberculosis and so on. So when we have a disturbance, uh, a lack of signaling or proper activation in this pathway, the patient will eventually develop 
the so-called hyper IgM syndrome. So the current uh, diagnostic and therapeutic, therapeutic algorithm for this disease include um, the evaluation of uh, the presence of a CD40 ligand uh, in the surface of the cells. And if it, it is reduced, uh, we have a suspicion on that and uh, it will be eventually screened for uh, the genetic alterations. As well, uh, we will direct the patient for the treatment and the treatment will include the immunoglobulin replacement therapy, as well as uh, to plan the uh, bone marrow transplant for this patient and in the future, uh, perhaps we will have available uh, the gene therapy uh, therapeutics. So the main clinical features uh, for those patients uh, include the upper and lower respiratory tract infections, gastro gastrointestinal manifestations, central nervous system problems, malignancies, autoimmunity, sepsis, and so on. And the immunological findings include the defective immunoglobulin class switching, the neutropenia, the defective memory T cells, the low production of uh, interferon gamma, defective neutrophil maturation, defective macrophage maturation, and defective, defective dendritic cell activation. So, uh, looks that uh, the interaction of CD40 and CD4 ligand is central for the proper immune cell activation. So the principal uh, therapeutic approaches currently approved include uh, the immunoglobulin uh, replacement therapy uh, and the antibiotic prophylaxis, including uh, sulfamethoxazole, trimetropine, and or uh, azithromycin, and for patients that will develop neutropenia, the subcutaneous uh, GCSF, and eventually the uh, bone marrow transplant. And um, an update, we are aware that uh, gene therapy uh, treatment for CD40 ligand deficiency uh, perhaps will come on uh, in more one year or two. So it's under uh, development. Uh, one point uh, that perhaps uh, we can consider as well is the replacement of human interferon gamma. So uh, this kind of proposal came from studies that we have developed uh, during the last years. We eventually found that uh, those patients, uh, because of the not proper activation of the T cells, they release very low levels of interferon gamma. And uh, perhaps uh, if we can replace additional interferon gamma, uh, we can overcome at least in part the impaired activation due to the defective CD40 and CD40 ligand uh, activation. So the perspectives include um, the absence of uh, CD40 in pairs, both adaptative and uh, innate immune responses. Uh, with few exceptions, uh, we do not have a very strong phenotype genotype correlations. And even on antibiotic prophylaxis, we, um, the, GCSF administration and immunoglobulin uh, replacement therapy are necessary for some uh, CD40 ligand deficient patients. And patients treated uh, in the last three decades with a bone marrow transplant improved uh, life quality, but the overall survival of post transplantation is less favorable when they have other. Uh, immunodeficiencies. 
the improved neutrophil function uh, achieved by recombinant interferon gamma uh, suggests a new potential adjuvant therapy. And uh, the gene therapy perspective is something that we have uh, to look for. Uh, what happened here is that this presentation, for some reason, came to the end. I will go now to the beginning to show you uh, uh, more additional uh, important information. So let me go here. So making uh, additional considerations, um, what happens? Uh, you know that primary immunodeficiencies include uh, over uh, 485 monogenic diseases that will present with recurrent infections, autoimmunity, autoinflammation, allergy, and cancer. Uh, and uh, hyper agent syndrome is within this group has some genotypes and phenotypes that will eventually lead to this kind of uh, manifestations. But mostly important is to say the susceptibility to infections, some autoimmunity, dysregulation that currently occurs, and uh, in some patients, the susceptibility to cancer. So this is the picture. Uh, to show here is the CD40 and CD4 ligand uh, interaction. The CD40 ligand is uh, expressed here on the T helper lymphocytes, interacts with the CD40 on the B cells. And this kind of signaling is very important uh, for proper activation of the B cells to produce the antibodies. As you see here, there are additional molecules like the AID, UMG, that may uh, be uh, a target of mutations and also uh, eventually lead to hyper IgM syndrome, but the autosomal uh, forms of the disease. On this list, uh, I will uh, show you uh, some of the most uh, uh, genetic forms of hyper IgM. The CD40 ligand uh, is the most well-known and the most frequent and the most important. Uh, it is an X-linked disease, so uh, we will affect boys, uh, generally from mothers carrying uh, a defective uh, CD40 ligand gene on the X chromosome. But also uh, it can occur as a uh, uh, the novel mutation during uh, the pregnancy. For the United States and uh, Europe, North America, Pneumocystis girovesi is and Cryptosporidium, Cytomegalovirus, and Candida albicans are very important pathogens for this disease. And for developing countries, uh, Aspergillus and uh, Leishmania, uh, PB mycosis, BCG, and tuberculosis are also uh, important occurrences. Then we have the other uh, autosomal diseases with the CD40 molecule, uh, mutation, uh, AICDA, UNG are also well known uh, autosomal uh, recessive. Uh, forms of the disease, and there are more uh, recent described, like the NEMO, the from the NF kappa B pathway, ATM, NBN, uh, MSH6, MSH2, MRA11, INO80, PAK3 C delta, uh, PAK PIK3 R1. Um, TNFRS F13B, ICOS CD19, TNFRS F13C. So they have all of these autosomal forms. They may follow a dominant or recessive uh, 
pattern of inheritance, LRDA, NF-kappa-B1, REC2, BTK, SAP, etc. So um, when we find a patient with hyper-IGM, uh, what I have just shown you on that review paper, uh, it is very important to go on and try to elucidate the molecular pattern of inheritance. And if it's a boy, uh, we will eventually uh, screen for the CD40 ligand disease. But one important thing to say is that not always, uh, at least for the CD40 ligand uh, form of the disease, not always you will find a very high hyper IgM form. So you look at the clinical situation on the pattern of infections, which geographical area uh, does that boy come from? Well, for us in South America, we have to look on uh, some tropical diseases. I'll show you some examples. And if the boy has uh, defective IgG and defective IgA, and uh, you only have a, a, a certain amount of IgM, does not need necessarily to be very high, we have to consider the hyper IgM uh, possible diagnosis and screen for these defects. Uh, so the CD40 ligand database shows uh, all of those kind of possible mutations, the missense, nonsense, deletion, frame shift, insertions, splice site mutations. So everything can, can occur. And um, that kind of occurrences happen uh, frequently on X-linked diseases. It's very heterogeneous by the way it happens, uh, the inheritance. Uh, for example, another classical uh, X-linked diseases like uh, chronic granulomatous disease also has a very heterogeneous uh, genetic pattern of inheritance when the CYBB gene is uh, involved. Here is the collection of uh, mutations that we have found on a group of uh, patients in Latin America, showing again a very heterogeneous uh, pattern. The CD4 ligand is, uh, there is no uh, specific uh, hotspot mutation. So it is heterogeneous as it is in the United States or Europe. So these are the types of infection on Latin American patients. Uh, as I was commenting with you, you know, uh, Pneumocystis urovesi, Candida, Aspergillus, Microsporidium, okay, but uh, PB mycosis uh, is uh, something that can happen on these patients. Histoplasma, Capsulatum, uh, from the gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, like it happens in other places. But here, mycoplasma pneumonia is an important issue. Mycobacterial tuberculosis, Giardia cryptosporidium parvum is a very important occurrence, and isospora is also uh, an important pathogen. So as you can see, uh, it is very diverse, the pattern of infections and the attending physician has to be uh, very uh, uh, cautious on uh, this kind of diagnosis. Here is the pattern of uh, inheritance on our uh, group of patients and uh, the family pedigrees. As you can see, uh, so these are uh, the boys because it's a CD40 ligand uh, deficiency. But unfortunately, there is a delay on the diagnosis. You, you see many affected boys uh, evolving uh, to a fatal uh, outcome. 
before uh, a definitive diagnosis could be established. So uh, fortunately uh, for these uh, last years, things have improved uh, in the diagnosis on our region and now uh, those kind of diseases are making uh, much faster. Here is some examples, uh, paracoxidioidal mycosis, something on a tropical area. This patient with uh, isospora belly, this patient with uh, tuberculosis, this patient with candidiasis, this patient with uh, aspergillosis in, in the bronchospergillosis in the lung, and uh, casuals granuloma uh, in the TB. Uh, this patient with the uh, TB mycosis. Here in more uh, detail, the hospital belly patient. Here, uh, Mycobacterium marino. So this girl got, uh, this was a girl on an autosomal form. Sorry, this is a mistake, it's a girl. Uh, this girl was infected uh, because she liked uh, to clean her aquarium and he, she got this kind of infection in the, uh, by cleaning the aquarium with uh, mycobacterium marino. This is uh, American data for the USDI net uh, showing that neutropenia is uh, the most important uh, complication, the more frequent complication of non-infections uh, complications for hyper-IgM syndrome, the GI uh, infections, aptose ulcer, yes. Uh, this aptose ulcer, uh, also I have seen uh, them very frequently here, and it's a very, a difficult clinical situation to handle. So it is something that I would like to stress, especially for the groups of patients that we have seen here. And the other thing I would like to point out is the uh, sclerosis and cholangitis. It is a very important complication because of uh, infection, cryptosporidium, and we have to be very aware of that possible diagnosis and be very aggressive in the treatment uh, in order to avoid uh, future irreversible uh, complications. So the syndromes, the most frequent ones uh, include uh, the CD40 ligand mutation, CD40 mutation, AID deficiency, UNG deficiency, the NEMO deficiency, especially in associated with uh, uh, hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia, and also uh, in other uh, kinds of um, gene mutations. Uh, they are relatively rare. Uh, I have seen uh, for our local conditions here, uh, LRBA and PIK3 delta uh, mutations associated with hyper IgM mutations, but it, it's not that frequent. Uh, so, uh, in summarizing, uh, these patients will have um, recurrent bacterial and opportunistic infections, the neutropenia the very low uh, IgA and IgG serum with normal or high IgM. So that's what I was telling. Sometimes we have normal IgM levels, but we have to characterize the very low serum IgG and IgA. And so not necessarily a, a very high IgM levels. Apparently normal TNB cells counts, but we have to figure out that they do not work properly. Germinal centers uh, are impaired. Uh, memory B cells are impaired. No somatic hypermutation and impaired uh, T lymphocytes, uh, DC crosstalk, so there is no uh, interaction uh, between T lymphocytes and dendritic cells. 
So pneumocystis are very important uh, pathogens, especially for infants. Cryptosporidium is very severe and goes uh, to the liver. Neutropenia may require GCSF additional treatment. Abdominal tumor, tumors associated with the biliary tract because of this chronic uh, infection and inflammation uh, caused by cryptosporidium. Some patients will evolve with progressive neurodegeneration and some patients can go to uh, red cell aplasia due to parvovirus infection. So uh, the most uh, important uh, evidence suggestion T cell dysfunction are uh, pneumocystis uh, infection, cryptosporidium, and uh, the lymphoid hyperplasia malignancy. That's a point uh, to mention when you find out a hyper HM patient with a lymphoproliferative uh, presentation, we have to suspect on uh, lymphoid uh, malignancy like a lymphoma. So, I would like to thank you very much uh, for your attention. I still did not understood why the slides played this trick with me, but I tried to manage it uh, as best as I could do. Thank you. And I will be here to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Condito Nito, for providing that overview. Um, so now we have some time for some questions. Before we begin, uh, please remember that everyone's treatment and condition are unique. The information presented during this session is not medical advice, nor is it intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with questions concerning a medical condition. Um, so we've received some great questions. Let's go to the first one. So the first one is, can you explain what differentiates hyper-IgM from MIMO? Um, involves the NF-kappa-B pathway so that uh, the activation of the interaction and the activation of both T cells and B cells uh, do not go well. And the class switch has a prejudice, does not work properly. So eventually uh, the patient will evolve with the hyper IgM uh, phenotype uh, and the patient will be unable uh, to develop memory T cells or memory B cells and will not make IgG antibodies. So it's a, it's a phenotypic uh, finding, but uh, you know, sometimes uh, now I will make a parallel with uh, the SCID, the severe combined immunodeficiency. When we say uh, about, uh, when we face SCID babies, SCID babies are the most severe immunodeficiency uh, already described. So the, pa the, the babies will be born without uh, an adaptive immune system. Uh, so the T cells just do not show up by several reasons, or they do not work. So NEMO, depending on the type of genetic defect, you may find some residual function or depending on the molecular location of the mutation, uh, the molecular performance, the function uh, may allow some uh, adaptive immune cell function so when we see a hyper IgM associated with that kind of phenotype, yes, it is a combined immunodeficiency. We look at hyper IgM as a combined immunodeficiency, but uh, this patient did not develop the severe combined immunodeficiency as it is uh, originally described for NEMO uh, deficiency. So it's a phenotypic variation, it goes to the classification of uh, hyper IgM syndrome as a combined immunodeficiency, but depending on the molecular defect can go to the SCID group, phenotype group, which is much more severe. 
So it's just phenotypic presentation, varies uh, the treatment and the urgency obviously is different, uh, but anyway, requires uh, proper uh, management. Thank you so much for explaining that. Um, so the next one is, are there any autoimmune conditions that are common in people with hyper IgM? It's very frequent. Autoimmune conditions, because of the dysregulation, it's very frequent to find in hyper IgM uh, patients. Um, varies depending uh, on the case, but it's very frequent, especially with uh, aging process. Uh, there are patients especially the ones that are not that severe. So they will go uh, through life and uh, later on the, the autoimmunity will show up. Great, thank you. Um, is there genetic testing for hyper IgM? Sorry, can you repeat? I did not get it. Sorry, is there genetic testing? So genetic, testing. Gen genetic testing. Okay. Uh, before ordering the genetic testing, uh, should be good if we do some lab routine tests in order to characterize the cell phenotype. So by doing regular flow cytometer assays, at least we can go on the most frequent forms like the CD40 ligand deficiency, the CD40 deficiency, the AID and UNG. So for those ones, uh, you can screen previously and then you can direct your genetic testing according to the lab tests. But eventually if the case is not that crystal clear, you can go on exome sequencing and make your differential genetic uh, approach. It will help to eventually get a genetic uh, diagnosis. Thank you. And is hyper IgM only present in males? Uh, you spoke a little bit fast. <laughs> if hyper IgM is. <laughs> Hyper-IgM only present in males and not... Oh, okay. It's more frequent in males because uh, the most frequent form is the CD40 ligand deficiency. And the coding region for that kind of molecule uh, relies on the X chromosome. So when it is defective uh, in males, there is not the other... X chromosome to compensate. So then uh, that's what we say, the X-linked disease that will affect males. So that's why uh, hyper-IgM syndrome is more frequent in males. Why? Because the most frequent form is the CD40 ligand deficiency, which is X-linked. Perfect, thank you. Um, do you I've got a patient, um, they have hyper IgM, um, IgG, absent IgA, um, and it looks like they recently had a fungal culture. Um, and this came back specifically with yeast candida zelenoids. I probably pronounced that incorrectly. Mm -hmm. um, but it looks like they were giving clotrimazole trophy to treat this. Um, do you know of any proper medicine to cure this specific fungus? Uh, that's tricky. Uh, fungal infections uh, are generally uh, very hard to clear in hyper IgM patients, especially the CD40 or the CD40 lichen deficiency. So, um, if you already have detected uh, your fungal infection, and indeed in this case, uh, the candida species was already identified, you can follow the protocols that are generally used for treating candida, but in parallel, uh, it is possible to order a lab test to test the sensitivity for antifungal drugs. 
because if it does not work with an antifungal drug, you can try other ones. Perfect, thank you. Um, so the next one is a patient that is asking how to explain this to their gastroenterologist. Um, so they do have GI symptoms um, and they were just trying to explain how hyper IgM affects how they present with their symptoms. In gastrointestinal tract, okay. I would point out uh, two major problems. One is the cryptosporidium infection that may affect the biliary tract. So it will eventually uh, cause an inflammation on the biliary tract and the patient will uh, have difficulties to release bile and eventually will present with jaundice. So the patient will become yellow. If you have a hyper IgM patient, you look at the eyes, and the eyes is starting to get yellow. It's a, a major signal uh, that uh, this patient is probably uh, developing a biliary tract infection. And um, it is a difficult uh, clinical condition to treat, but obviously uh, it is possible, and we have always to go on. Uh, trying to solve it. The other thing that is very frequent is diarrhea because of uh, infections by protozoa. I have shown you the patient with the zospora with uh, very uh, uh, severe nutritional uh, consequence. So um, it is uh, uh, frequent to find those patients with chronic diarrhea. So the, the advice is uh, try to identify uh, what kind of infection is involved. Because if it, it, it is uh, hyper IgM, you may have chances to identify. It's not a kind of uh, common diarrhea, it's persistent. And uh, you may eventually find and give the proper treatment. So it is very important to try to identify it. Thank you. Okay, so um, here's the next one. Is HSCT a treatment option for hyper IgM? And what about gene therapy? Uh, for CD40 ligand disease, yes, there is uh, uh, a therapy under development. Some years ago, uh, it was. Uh, performed the gene therapy experimentally, but it didn't work because um, CD40 ligand is a kind of molecule that requires modulation adjustment. You don't want your T cells with uh, ever activated CD40 ligand molecule because the patient will develop eventually a very strong inflammatory clinical picture and may die of, uh, uh, of uh, extreme inflammation. So you don't want CD40 ligand to be present and expressed. CD40 ligand is a kind of molecule to be expressed and activated when you need it to be activated. So that's the trick. Uh, to uh, eventually uh, develop the gene therapy, we have to find a way to modulate the expression of that molecule. It's not only about correcting the genetic sequencing. What happened previously with the gene therapy is that platelets uh, also have CD40 molecule. And if you have a lot of CD40 ligand molecule expressed in T cells, it will induce activation of platelets and the patient will develop, eventually develop thrombosis. So it's a, a, a complication that happened and that's why the gene therapy uh, uh, protocol was uh, interrupted and came back for further research and development. But uh, for now, uh, we have more uh, 
encouraging results and uh, that will be that should be uh, come uh, it will not last a long time to return for uh, clinical applications the other part of the question was about the bone marrow transplant that you asked me yes they were just specifically asking about um, gene therapy um, mm -hmm. anything like on the horizon for that or any new you know, research that you've seen or promises. Yeah, so that's the good news. There is uh, uh, previously uh, uh, the scientists uh, found the way to correct the gene. So the molecule was expressed, but still fully expressed during all time expressed. And that is not good because it leads to too much inflammation. Now uh, they, ha they have learned how to modulate that and it will uh, come out uh, on, a, on a good, uh, on a proper treatment. Thank you. Okay, so this next one I know that you touched a little bit on um, cancer. This person is asking, are enlarged lymph nodes common? And at what point should you be worried as a patient that they may be malignant? Uh, again, you talk a little bit faster. I understood <laughs> it's about cancer susceptibility. Is that we have enlarged lymph nodes? Um, okay, um, they're just wondering if they commonly have them enlarged. Do they need mm -hmm. to worry about cancer? Do they need to have more screening done? Um, or at what point are you as a physician concerned that it may be something more? Definitely, uh, when a hyper IgM patient shows up with enlarged lymph nodes, uh, so it's it is characterized by enlargement of lymph nodes, spleen, liver. So it's a lymphoproliferative syndrome. Definitely, you have to screen for lymphomas uh, or and or viral infections. Uh, EBV infection, for instance, or other kind of viral infections can trigger that kind of uh, lymphoproliferative uh, situation. But even if you characterize a viral infection, it is necessary to exclude, to rule out uh, a lymphoma. So it is necessary to go on biopsy. Thank you. So the next question is, could hyper-IgM ever be detected by newborn screening, like skin? Yes, that's an interesting question. Um, you know this uh, button here I'm using? So it's, um, uh, this is the month of uh, newborn screening is International Month for Newborn Screening, and I really work a lot uh, for this cause here in Brazil. And um, the experience shows that there are the tracks and cracks, as say, the T-cell receptor excision circles that you detect on newborn screening uh, dry blood spots. They will be an evidence of uh, active normal T cells proliferating. So when you don't have, when you don't find the tracks, you have a, a, a very strong uh, suggestion that that particular baby does not have uh, a proper activation or cell uh, presence of uh, T cells. Uh, the way that the tracks uh, assays were previously set up when it started more than 10 years ago, the sensitivity and specificity was something black and white uh, to say, well, uh, this baby has a kind of uh, uh, a skid, so has nothing of these cells or almost nothing. And when you look at, then you will find the several uh, forms of skin. But what happens is that more recently, the tracks assays have been perfected. 
so that it will detect the several colors of the gray, okay? So it's not only black and white, now they are quantitative. The assays we have developed here in Brazil are tracks, tracks, and they see the gray colors. So they will see uh, the skid babies, but they will see other immunodeficiencies, other combined immunodeficiencies. And I would say, yes, it is possible to find uh, hyper IgM syndrome in, among these patients. For example, uh, in the city of Sao Paulo now, it became universal uh, in the last two years. And we have screened around uh, 240,000 babies with that kind of a say. We have found uh, eight skid skid babies. Uh, they are characterized molecularly. So that said is the double of what was found uh, in statistics compared to the United States. We have found two uh, agama globulinemia patients because we used the track, the cracks assay. So again, is for these statistics is the double of reported in the literature. And we have found a congenital leukemia on the cracks assay. It was the first case of the literature we published that. And more than that, we have found 200 additional babies with other forms of uh, immunodeficiencies that are under uh, follow-up, clinical care, and characterizing the molecular defect. So the way that we have set up the tracks and quirks assay allowed us to identify one affected baby for each 1,000 tests. So it's much more frequent and much more higher than we have expected. So here in Brazil, the program that we are developing is not only about black and white and skits. We are not doing things to find one baby in 58,000 screens. We are finding immunodeficiencies in one per 1,000 uh, babies. Uh, I, uh, we, uh, for now, we did not find yet any uh, hyper IgM babies uh, on this, but I am sure we will eventually find because uh, hyper IgM syndrome, CD40 ligand deficiency or CD40 deficiency is a kind of combined immunodeficiency. And yes, we, we are on risk to find them and we will let you know as soon as possible when we find. Thank you so much. Sounds like a lot of exciting things on the horizon. Mm -hmm. um, so our time together has come to an end. I wanted to thank Dr. Condido Nito for um, joining us today. It's been an honor to have you. And um, this session is one of 39 unique learning experiences. Um, if you have any further questions on this topic, uh, make sure to submit a question to ask IBF. Um, there are directions on how to do so on our web page. Um, we continue um, our programming now. Hope you stay tuned in. And um, everyone has a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, IDF, for this kind of invitation. And we are always here ready uh, to help you. <laughs>